Hello and welcome to Telescience Museum and our, our, in, our latest installation of Ask the Expert. I'm David Dundee, Director of Education, and I'm so glad you've chosen to, to be part of our, our program this afternoon. I wanted to first thank our sponsors, uh, Century Bank of Cartersville, uh, Courtyard uh, Marriott of, part of Cartersville, and also Homelight for their generous support. Um, Want to let you know our next Ask the Expert is on November the 10th, and we will have our hosting Dr. William Hazeltine, and he will be talking about his new book, Science as a Superpower. And so we have lots of exciting things coming up here at TELUS. This weekend, uh, we have our annual Heavy Metal in Motion, We'll be bringing big machines here to uh, the museum. Uh, we'll have two helicopters landing, uh, fire trucks, SWAT vehicles. Uh, uh, we'll have a biocontainment unit uh, here from Phoenix Air, uh, motorcycles, and some interactive activities uh, for our younger guests. And uh, just a great day to come out and enjoy uh, all of these things and meet some state troopers with their with their SWAT vehicles and also with the, their vehicles and firemen and and uh, also we'll have an ambulance and Georgia Power large trucks. And so lots of cool stuff like that to come see. And it's gonna be beautiful weather. So please come and see us this Saturday at TELUS. Um, also coming up uh, at TELUS, uh, we, we have uh, our international Observe the Moon Night on the night of October 15th, uh, and we'll have our observatory open. And in fact, that night, in addition to uh, ask the expert, um, we will also, uh, and pardon me, uh, to uh, International Moon Watch, uh, we will have a lecture uh, from Dr. Ga Gary uh, Vasio, uh, and he will be talking about uh, aspects of COVID. He is the chief medical officer for Northwest Georgia, and so you don't want to miss that interesting evening, plus planetarium shows, and of course, uh, watching uh, our Moon Watch event uh, in the observatory. And also put on your calendar uh, on the very early morning hours, that means like two in the morning, um, starting uh, here at TELUS, we will have a partial lunar eclipse. It's almost total, but not quite. So it's pretty close to it. It'll be a great evening. Uh, to watch the moon uh, in going into eclipse. Well, let me introduce to you our, our, our uh, program for today. Um, we have two experts with us, for the, two for the price of one, uh, that will be talking uh, to us uh, today. Uh, first, uh, John uh, Bolakowski, um, he is uh, uh, joining us and he joined the Sikorsky uh, aircraft uh, company in 1970 as design and analytic engineer and uh, broadened his 32 year career with successive positions in engineering, marketing, licensing, and program management, where he ascended to director of the U.S. Army uh, Air Force H-60 production line. Mr. Bolakowski uh, also was part of the original Sikorsky design and proposal effort uh, that won uh, the utility tactical support aircraft system uh, completion uh, for the Black Hawk, Black Hawk tele, uh, uh, helicopter. Um, he led uh, uh, an effort to build the Black Hawk under license uh, in the Republic of Korea. And upon retiring, Mr. Balakowski continued as a contractor with Sikorsky for another 18 years uh, in the program and uh, is uh, now um, at the uh, is the vice president of Sikorsky Historical Archives. Mr. Bolakowski holds a bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's in business administration. Uh, and we're joined also with uh, Dan uh, uh, Libertino, and uh, he has served as president of the Igor Sikorsky Historical Archives since 2004. He continues a 70-year association with Sikorsky helicopters begun in 1951 as a U.S. Air Force mechanic um, 
And on active duty, Mr. Libertino was assigned to French Indonesia as a, as a uh, technical advisor to the French Air Force. Uh, then on the new uh, uh, S-55H-19D utility helicopters. And after his military service, he joined uh, the uh, Petroleum Helicopters Incorporated. And in 1954, the earliest phase of offshore helicopter passenger operations with the S-55. Uh, Mr. Libertino joined Sikorsky Aircraft in 1956 and over 41 year career uh, provided expertise into the introduction of six um, Sikorsky helicopter models uh, in the US military and nine uh, in foreign countries. Um, and so we have two experts. He has encyclopedic knowledge of Sikorsky uh, helicopters and products. And we're so glad to have both of them here today. And our presentation will cover uh, Igor Sikorsky's uh, decision to develop his first helicopter and trace the accomplishments uh, through his three careers, emphasizing uh, each of the helicopters that he uh, and uh, his uh, legacy uh, at the Sikorsky uh, Aircraft Company. And we'll focus on uh, his belief that the helicopter is the outstanding vehicle for the greatest variety of life-saving missions. So I welcome you both to our program, Dan and John. And Dan, you're starting off talking about this, so uh, take it away. Well, David, thank you. And uh, we are thrilled to be to share this event with you uh, and uh, to the audience. Uh, welcome, and I hope you enjoy this presentation of this national treasure. We think of Igor Sikorsky as a national treasure. Uh, to get back to the archives, in November 1995, we were incorporated as an independent nonprofit organization to dedicate our efforts to the preservation and dissemination of the life and history of Igor and his companies. There you go. Igor was born in uh, May 25, 1889 in Kiev. Kiev was part of Imperial Russia in those days, and now the Ukraine, uh, to very, two very educated, well parents, a father, a doctor of philosophy, and a mother, a medical doctor, but their mother chose to raise the children. Igor, being the youngest of five children, received a lot of support and attention from the family. Here you see the house they lived in. That house still stands today. It's in kind of disrepair, uh, and it's been on again, off again to establish a museum from it, with it, but uh, it never kind of materializes. But this is the house. The first floor is where you, the, his, the father had a, his offices. The second floor is where the family lived. And the third floor was a handicap uh, for uh, underprivileged children. The two sisters had the school where they taught and, and took care of these, these uh, people in need. Next. Igor's mother was very inf influential on him. He, she motivated, Igor first of all was an avid reader and she encouraged him to become familiar with Leonardo da Vinci and the aerial screw, one of the inventions that, that he was greatly publicized. And then Jules Verne's, his writings are signed in the 1980s, late 80s. Uh, he became very familiar with these here and they left an image from him that kind of directed him towards a helicopter, but he was still a very young boy. So in, in um, 1908, Igor accompanied his father on his annual sabbatical to the French Alps in Germany. And during this uh, visit, he was able to be, to read firsthand what was happening in aviation. Uh, what was happening in aviation. And uh, he, uh, I lost the tr track, something happened here with the machine. But um, 
anyway, he lost track. He um, started with with AB. John, pick it up here. I I lost my trend. Something sure. happened. Sure. At at that point in time, uh, Sikorsky learned first first details about the Wright brothers. Really. Yeah. And he decided to make a decision to go and enter aviation by way of a thing called a helicopter. Yeah. He, uh, Ego saw this here and announced to his father he wanted to make uh, aviation his life career. And uh, this was the first time he expressed that. His earliest attempts to build a helicopter was in 1909. You see the image of the, of the helicopter there was a two blade paddle rotor system, one on top of the other coaxial rotor. It was not very, very good. It had severe vibrations. Igor kind of understood what was going on and he moved over in 1910 and created the, uh, the H2. He had a three paddle blade system, one on top of the other. And this was much better and the vibrations were resolved. And But Igor soon realized that it was grossly underpowered and there was nothing available to give the power to need to lift him and the helicopter. So he put that dream aside and moved on to fixed wing aircraft. He initially, and he's now starting from scratch, writing, laying out, working on them, building the aircraft. He built aircraft called the S for Sikorsky, one, two, three, and four. One never flew, one he had an accident with, one just kind of hopped and skipped, but each one was a learning curve. And finally, he built an aircraft called the S-5. <coughs> the S-5 was when he really got the sensation of flying. The aircraft just wanted to fly. He learned, taught himself how to pilot. He then applied for a license through the Russian Aero Club to the French Federation and was issued a pilot's license number 64. You see it in the lower left hand, lower left hand corner, um, number 64. That was his license issued through the French Federation. So Russian years, here you see um, this period of time. These are the different models. You can see a lot of them one of a kind, uh, the S-16 was a little better, 27 aircraft. But really the significant aircraft that he will always be remembered for is the S-21. One of them were built. That was the first multi-engine heavy lift aircraft to be built in the world. And that led to a Varma version uh, that you see down below called the Ilya Morimets with the S-22 and the S-20 through the S-27, 85 of those were built and used in World War I. So 20 models over this uh, period of seven years and 157 aircraft, most of them uh, were of the Ilya Morimets with 85. Now, the Russian Revolution is going on and he gets the word through the employees at the factory that um, that his life is threatened. And he makes a decision to leave Russia. Uh, he, he has a, a daughter by a short-lived marriage, which is taken care of by his sister. Uh, his, his, uh, they had separated and the sister was taking care of this year. Uh, the mother had, his mother had passed away and the father was still alive but he made the decision to leave via, Fran via England and then on to France. And from France, he came to New York in 1919 with full of enthusiasm to continue his aviation career. He arrived on March 5th, 1923. Uh, but the war was over here as well. So as it goes, the, the industry began to wind down and he was struggling. So for the next three years or so, he taught mathematics in a Russian immigrant school, and he lectured on the stars and astronomy, stars in the universe, where he made money to survive uh, as a living. Okay. 
1929, I mean, in 1923, March, March 25th, Igor started uh, March, uh, yeah, March 25th, I'm sorry. Um, Igor started the Sikorsky Aero Engineering Corporation. And he was, he was offered the facilities of a farm by the, fa the family name was Utkov and they were friends from Russia and he had migrated to America and he offered the farm. And there you see the first production facility on the left. On the, on the right side is Roosevelt Field. After they had accumulated some funds, they were able to lease facilities at, at Roosevelt Field. And there they began the construction of the S-29. And that followed a movement to College Point, New York, where they designed and built the S-38. This was his most successful fixed wing aircraft in America. That led to the need for expansion, and they acquired property in 1928 in Stratford, Connecticut, a facility that would have given them 100 acres for a plant, an airport, and access to deep water for the amphibious type aircraft. Ego would then continue on with the, with the flying boats and so forth, leaving College Point for Stratford in uh, 1928. And in 1929, the company was sold to United Aircraft. And with that sale, there was an infusion of money to, to allow Igor to continue the helicopter design. Okay. During that, that period, the fixed wing period, if you want to, 15 models, 223 aircraft built, 111 of them was, were the, uh, the S-38 and 19 year span that was covered. Now the early legacy, uh, when Igor started in 1939 um, <coughs> with the VS-300. Now it's called VS-300 because uh, in 19, uh, 20, 1939, the company was merged with Vought Aircraft and they became known as Vought Sikorsky. And Vought continued working on the fighter aircraft for World War II. Ego was finishing off his flying boats and, and started with the VS-300. And here you see in September of 14, 1939, Ego took off with the first helicopter. Now, Ego is not the inventor of it, but he was always clear to say that I was able to put together a practical machine to him. That went through a series of two, two, uh, two year series of changes, flights up and down. Every flight generated a change until in 1941, the final configuration that you see in the lower left hand, low right hand corner. And that's the VS 300. That aircraft, one of a kind, is now on display at the Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. With that machine, Ego was also recognized having was issued certificate number one, clearly as a helicopter pilot. That's the first time a designation of rotary wing or helicopter would be given to anyone. And this is the license that you have here. Now, if you were around in those two year period as Igor was flying those different versions, if it was fall and winter, he was flying with that fedora on his head. And you see it holding holding there, but he pushed it down on his head and uh, it stayed there. And if it was on his head and you saw the aircraft in the air, you knew it was fall and winter. Um, for spring and summer, he used a baseball cap. But this hat, became very famous during Korea. Korea was the world awakening to the helicopter when you began to read every day in the paper about it. And Sikorsky helicopters were largely involved with moving of troops and moving of, um, equipment and whatever out of arms way, uh, rescue down pilots that have gone down. And they started to say, 
if you came to Sikorsky and you saw that hat and you were able to touch it or wear it, you'll always be safe in a helicopter. And today, that still exists. Today, a military officer who may have been, may only be 30 years old or so, would come there and asking about the fedora. That's, here you see one of his early patents, and this is a patent that established, established his concept. And the concept is a single main rotor and a single tail rotor. That configuration dominates to today the helicopter industry. Most all manufacturers use this configuration. In the back, you see a whole list of 66 patents that were awarded to Igor Sikorsky during his tenure with the United Aircraft when we were a corporate uh, part of the United Aircraft and he was alive, of course. November 25 to 19, July 60, 66 patents. He's the leading of, of, of the, all of the engineering staff or people that got patents at that time. Now, the early helicopters began. The one you see in the front of you on the left side is the S-47. Now, that became the derivative from that, last, from that VS-300, and this became the first production helicopter in the Western, certainly in the Western world. And I qualify it because had the war not happened, the Germans were, would, would have been advanced ahead of this here. But in the Western world, this was the helicopter that went into production in 1943 and is the only one that saw active service during World War II. The following aircraft, the S-48, that's a very interesting aircraft. When I was training for on helicopter in the Air Force in 1951, I was trained on an S-48 aircraft, pretty primitive. Uh, in the background uh, to the left is the uh, S-49, the one you see in below. And that was unique. Sikorsky built five prototypes, six prototypes, and designed and accepted by the government. And then the government took it and gave it to Nash Calvinator. And Nash Calvinator built 200 of them beginning near the end of the, of the war and, and later on in the months there. Thanks. Now, the, the R-4 became the first aircraft to make a combat rescue. And here you see the crew and the machine. And it was in the China-Burma theater. Uh, now in Burma, now near Myanmar, and that aircraft with that, not with that crew, but that crew maintained it. They took off to make a rescue and will, with that. Continue. During the spring of 1944, Army pilots flying a Sikorsky R-4 record the first helicopter combat rescue. A downed American pilot and three British infantrymen are rescued from a rice paddy behind enemy lines surrounded by Japanese troops. John, and here it is. Now, um, during that period of time, not, the the Army Air Corps were the ones that design that paid for the design of this aircraft. But then the Navy, along with the Coast Guard, came on with their version of it, and it was all happening in the 43-44 area. Uh, now, during that period of time, Igor's son uh, Sergei. Igor's son, Sergei, was an airman machinist made at, at uh, Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn and with the Coast Guard. And Captain Erickson was the commander of the new helicopter unit that was charted with training and building devices and so forth to improve the rescue capabilities of it. And here you see Igor Sikorsky on one of his visits to F Floyd Bennett Field to see his son and to see what was going on with the machine. Here you see him demonstrating the versatility of the winch. And that's very primitive, but that was the very beginning of a winch rescue. And now in 1945, but off of Fairfield, Connecticut, Penfield Reef, a barge had been that was being towed to New York had gone aground in a heavy storm. And they contacted Sikorsky 
and Sikorsky took an S-48 uh, helicopter with a winch on it and a crewman in the back, and they went about 20 miles south. On November 29, 1945, a northeaster was blowing in gusts up to 60 miles an hour when an R-5 was called on to save the lives of two men. Their barge was aground on Penfield Reef in Long Island Sound, not far from the Sikorsky aircraft plant. A telephoto lens brings the barge close to shore. Actually, the wreck was more than one quarter of a mile from the beach. The first man was hoisted to safety and flown to shore on the cabin. without lifting him all the way up. He was hoisted clear of the wreckage on the deck. This episode is typical of the many rescues performed by Sikorsky helicopters in the last three years. Now, uh, the uh, as as we mentioned earlier, the helicopter was always Igor's vision for humanitarian role of saving lives. Uh, bringing people out of arms way and, and so forth. And in 1950, he started an award uh, that was called the Winged S Rescue Award. And uh, the first rescue is Frank Erickson, who was the ca commander of the unit at Floyd Bennett Field. Uh, there was a tremendous uh, explosion on a ship on the coast of, of New Jersey and they desperately needed plasma. And on a cold February wintry day, January wintry day, uh, they loaded the pilots, the co-pilot seat with plasma, and he made a flight by helicopter to where the ship was that had exploded. And that helped to save many lives. Ego made this award ret retroactive, beginning with Frank Gregory receiving the first one. Uh, by coincidence, uh, I was fortunate to receive an award in 1954 for participating in, believe it or not, uh, we recently heard all this about uh, Del Rio and Sia Cunha, Mexico, with the immigrants and so forth. And it was that very area where in 1954, with an H-19 helicopter, myself as part of a fleet of 10 aircraft, we took off and went all along the the uh, Rio Grande and my area uh, was uh, the Del Rio area, and we worked for six days doing humanitarian missions so they got re recognized for it. It's still a today, ever anybody that everybody wants the, the West Rescue Award. It's, it's a very, very cherished award. Uh, the early production helicopters following those three before. The S-51 was most significant, and it demonstrated a, a larger lifting cap capability. It could carry three people, and about 300 of them were built, and it was kind of the forerunner of a larger machine that was developed later on. Yeah. Okay, the, 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 the growth aircraft is significant ones is the S-55, 56, and 58 that you see there. Now, the S-55 and, and 58 are um, basically the Western world's choice of an intermediate helicopter. The S-55 could carry 10 people. Uh, we built 1,300 of those and then another 400 or so by foreign uh, licensees. And the 58 was a growth of that version, uh, carrying 12 to 14 people. 
and and we built 1800 of those with another 500 or so built by licensees uh, this was the last of the reciprocating engine the heavy weight gas engine that was in these aircraft the later aircraft began with the turbine powered machine now we had turbines that could drive the transmission turbines that produced high horsepower and were very lightweight giving added performance and the the beginning of those turbine aircraft is you see the s61 there a 19 passenger aircraft with twin turbines and the s62 with a single turbine from then on we started building aircraft with turbines Continued with the flying crane. Uh, the S-65 was the next generation heavy lift, a twin engine aircraft with heavy lift capacity, uh, largely used by the Marine Corps. The largest single operator was German, Germany. And I spent five, six years in Germany on the co-production of that aircraft there. Israeli also used them. And there you see an experimental uh, uh, attack aircraft uh, that we were trying to get the Army interested in using the dynamic components of the S-61, uh, but it never was accepted. Now, here's, here's, uh, we'll put on a video here, and it'll be an interview with Igor Sikorsky in 1967 at his desk by the editor of the New Haven Register. Many people consider it as slow helicopters, but good, real control characteristics could and would ever be constructed. Other pessimists say that even if you will construct a helicopter, no one would need this helicopter. I remember a good friend of mine and a very prominent designer, uh, scientist in aviation, asking, when would the helicopter go faster than the airplane? Do you know that? I said, yes, I know. The answer is never. When would the helicopter be more efficient than the airplane? You know that? I also said, yes, I know that. Never. But I said that the helicopter will do a number of jobs, which no airplane will do, and which, in fact, nothing else will do except the helicopter. Effort to return, and this time to build a successful helicopter. And with respect to the objective of the helicopter, one of the major things which I was aiming at was that I had every conviction the helicopter will prove a unique and extremely effective method or instrumentality for saving life. Yeah, this is another time in, in his life. Uh, uh, it started in, in 1908 when he profess what the, what he thought about the helicopter and here he reiterates again and this is another thing this is his last letter that he wrote sitting at his desk it's october 25th 1972 he's writing to the flight safety foundation in response to a letter that commended the helicopter not necessarily sikorsky but whatever helicopters were available that participated in a high-rise fire in San Paulo, Brazil. And there was hundreds of people on the roof of this high-rise and only helicopters could take him out, uh, of, out to safety. So Igor writes this letter and I'd like to read this one paragraph, which is really his vision that has been through mo all of his life. I always believed that the helicopter would be an outstanding vehicle for the greatest variety of life-saving missions. And now, near the close of my life, I have the satisfaction of knowing this proved to be true. He signed that letter, it was sent out, and the very next day, about 10 in the morning, as he prepared to come into the work as a consultant, he passed away. Now, this is his vision. During that period of time from 39 to 72, here's the models you see. Uh, the turbine power began with the S-59 there to demonstrate it, and then every other aircraft is all with um, uh, turbine-powered machines. 18 models 
a span of 31 years, 7,350 helicopters built during that time. John? Sure. Thank you, Dan. That was great. Uh, okay, so Mr. Sikorsky passed away, uh, but his inspiration continued. And we have one more clip from one more section of his uh, interview in 1967. And he's talking about a spark for teamwork. Uh, well, certainly the question of a teamwork entered now to a greater extent than ever before. And this is both in science and perhaps in every other branch of technique. Nevertheless, I am convinced that the work of the individual still remains a very important factor, still remains the spark which moves mankind ahead even more than teamwork. Teamwork comes into existence after the spark, the intuitive spark of a living man started something. Then later comes the teamwork to give a bigger body to the little soul which he created. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I submit to you that Igor Sikorsky was that spark that ignited the helicopter industry. Teamwork continues, though. In uh, 1973, a strange-looking helicopter, a coax, you remember Dan talking about it before with the H1 and the H2? Uh, this was the S69 ABC, or Advancing Blade concept. You can see it's a coax machine. Coaxial machines reduce or eliminate the necessity of having a tail rotor. And, uh, and uh, its first flight was in 1973. Uh, that coax airplane proved to be aircraft proved to be uh, very fast, and actually had a uh, uh, in, uh, outboard engines J60 turbojet engines put on it. And as you can see here, it was doing uh, a flight field uh, pass by at uh, 261 knots. So that vision continued, uh, starting with uh, the S78 Blackhawk. Uh, uh, I was assigned 49 years ago to assist in the preparation of the proposal to respond to an RFP for that aircraft. Uh, it was uh, awakening for me. Uh, that aircraft further spurred on an entirely separate model change, uh, model sequence called the S-70B, which was used for the Navy. Uh, two uh, experimental aircraft were built, the S-72 RSRA, or Rotor Systems Research Aircraft, in 76 and the S-75A cap, which was an advanced composite airframe program, which was to show that an aircraft could actually be made of pure composites. The airframe could be made of actual uh, composites, and the airframe could weight could be, could be reduced by 23%. S-76 was our first uh, recent commercial from the ground up aircraft. Our current production uh, on Sikorsky includes the S-92, which first flew in 98. Uh, uh, the S-76 continues to be delivered and variants of the S-70A and the S-70B Seahawk. Uh, between those two aircraft, over 4,000 aircraft have been produced. Continuing with Sikorsky's current production, uh, the big daddy of them all is the S-95 or the CH-53K Sea Stallion. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and a derivative of uh, the S-92, and it's called the VH-92, and that is the presidential aircraft. So within, I don't know exactly the date, but I'm going to guess it's, the testing is almost fully complete. I'm going to guess that within a year or two, we should be seeing an S-92 landing on the front lawn of the, uh, of the White House. Currently, we're finishing up deliveries of the S-70 combat rescue helicopter. This is another derivative of that Black Hawk aircraft. And uh, that will be used uh, for the U.S. Air Force. Sikorsky has a series of development programs. You remember way back when uh, that uh, Mr. Sikorsky started with the H-1 and the H-2, and those were coax. And you remember the S-69. And the S-69 actually proved that uh, you could break that, uh, that barrier of airspeed. And so uh, in 2008, Sikorsky developed, it was a single pilot, it was called the X-2, the S-94. And that was more recently followed by the S-97 Raider and the Defiant. And uh, those, the, uh, 
uh, both the Raider and the Defiant are meant to replace existing inventory aircraft within the U.S. Army. Uh, speed, autonomy, and intelligence. Speed is obvious and improves, improves uh, productivity and uh, uh, helo evacuations. Uh, it also, uh, on autonomy, uh, autonomy, there are mechanisms to provide tools to fly more missions and add effectiveness, and it enables additional uh, missions to be accomplished. Intelligence means that the aircraft is aware of its own conditions, uh, what's wearing out, what's going to break, uh, so that improves the safety and the economics of uh, flying the aircraft. So, very quickly, we just went through 80 years of Sikorsky helicopter production. Uh, of, of significance here, and we'll go back you see in this 1970s period, a big, big drop in production. This was a serious problem for Sikorsky. And this is when, if you remember the S9, I told you the S70 Blackhawk RFP came in. And this was absolutely a must win situation uh, for Sikorsky. Uh, all these bars that you see afterwards, the predominant value, the predominant aircraft that was being built was the Blackhawk. In all toll over those 80 years, Sikorsky has produced over 12,000 aircraft. Okay, let's just switch gears for a little bit and talk about what does uh, 80 years of growth mean to you? And I picked four categories, uh, gross weight and uh, cockpit and uh, total installed power and speed. Let's start off with the uh, gross weight. Uh, up to now, the heavy lifter of the time was the S-65. And by the way, there was a derivative of the S-65, and it was called the, uh, in the military parlance, a 53E. Uh, uh, but uh, the granddaddy of them all is this S-95 uh, Super Stallion that we see, the King Stallion, rather. Uh, it has a, a max gross weight of 88,000 pounds, could lift 36,000 pounds on its hook. And if the progression of gross weight capabilities of Sikorsky aircraft is any indication, I could well see where this aircraft will expand to be a 100,000 pound gross weight machine. Uh, another key uh, area is in cockpit instrumentation. I, I took this uh, left picture out from the S-47 flight manual, and uh, you can see the instruments there. It was pretty, pretty sparse on the instruments. And the uh, S-47 was designed and it could only fly uh, VFR, which means that you have to fly in daytime and clear weather and uh, certainly the instrumentation was not giving you a whole bunch of information about what was going around outside you. Compare that with a 1998 version of the S92. Cockpit has been totally uh, updated. Well, not it wasn't updated. It was, it's different from the S47 in that it's purely electronic. And uh, lets, the lets the pilots operate in all weather, day and night conditions. Third category. Now let's talk about growth. Dan talked about the uh, S-58, and uh, it was the last of the radial engines uh, aircraft. It produced a, a whopping 1,525 horsepower. Fast forward to the Blackhawk. Uh, it had two General Electric turboshaft engines in it, giving a total of 3,244 horsepower. And finally, that S-95 I was just talking about actually has three GE engines in it, totaling 22,500 horsepower. Uh, not only is the increased horsepower required and necessary for, uh, because of the growth weight, gross weight, weight rise of the helicopter, but also because the additional horsepower allows operation in hot and high conditions. We're talking 4,095 degrees Fahrenheit or 6,000 uh, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, last uh, uh, point that I wanted to make was on uh, speed growth. Uh, conventional aircraft, conventional helicopters, single main rotor, single tail rotor, fall into a physics uh, uh, barrier that says you can't really fly much faster than 150 knots. Uh, I talked about the inspiration of or the start of the H the uh, S69 uh, ABC as well as the other coax aircraft. And if I superimpose those values on top of that graph, you can see that the helicopter uh, of the future will be probably a coax 
and it will certainly be able able of, of uh, doing the 250 knot or better range of speed. I'm going to conclude this presentation with one more quote from Sikorsky, uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, very, very true. Uh, if, if a man is in need of rescue, an airplane can come in and throw flowers on him, and that's about it. Uh, but a direct lift aircraft, a helicopter, could come in and save his life. Uh, I was made aware of this coming uh, flick with uh, a few years ago, and uh, it's uh, a flick that was uh, made, and it features uh, Paul uh, uh, Brandhaver, uh, retired staff sergeant of the Army. And he has a totally different perspective. We talk about saving lives, and that, that's great. Uh, we have the, uh, the Sikorsky Awards for, for saving lives. Uh, but what about the people that have been saved? Without a doubt, um, I wouldn't be here right now without the Black Hawk helicopter. In 2004, I was ambushed with 12 of my buddies just north of Baghdad in Samarra, Iraq. It was basically the middle of nowhere. A rocket propelled grenade and small arms fire attacked us. RPG was a direct hit, killing my buddy Sam Bowen, wounding me when I had uh, blown out eardrums, um, a couple brain contusions, shattered pelvic bone, um, dislocated every joint in my body and 300 pieces of shrapnel and 29 bullets entered my body. A Black Hawk helicopter with another one trailing was on its way. And I didn't see it at first, but I heard the thumping sound and the vibration of the rotor blades. And it was just a really sweet sound, even from a deaf person. It was just one of those senses that will be with me forever. Um, but I knew that we were gonna be rescued to operate under those extreme conditions, uh, 144 degree temperatures and sand constantly flowing through the engine and to be able to function on a day-to-day -day basis. I've never seen one broken down. I wanted to uh, get the opportunity opportunity to come and thank people that helped preserve my life. Not only did you save my life because of what you do, I have a brother, a sister, a mother, uncles, aunts, cousins, and hundreds of friends. You impacted their life because you brought me home to them. They're happier kids because their daddy came home. I'm very grateful for my life and I live every day like it's my last. And if today was my last day, I'm already in heaven. Unfortunately, because of uh, time constraints, uh, we were not able to go into any depth on any of the many models of Sikorsky uh, helicopters, nor of any of their multiples of derivatives of those aircraft. Uh, and so uh, what we recommend is you visit us at uh, our website, SikorskyArchives.com. It is loaded with information on each one of those aircraft models that you saw. Uh, I would also recommend that uh, you, you avail yourself of picking up a copy of the Sikorsky Legacy book, it's, uh, the Images of Aviation, and it's a book that was co-written by Sergei Sikorsky, uh, Mr. Sikorsky's eldest son, as well as the Sikorsky Archives. Uh, by the way, while you're on the uh, Sikorsky Archives, go look at our newsletter section, and uh, you'll see four issues uh, starting in October of uh, 20 uh, that really trace the 80 years that you just walked through. And there's a lot more detail in each one of those uh, newsletters for you to take a look at. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention.
Well, that, that was that was fascinating. Thank you, John, and thank you, Dan. Um, we do have several questions that have been coming in off our uh, off our website, and um, just wanted to start off with uh, uh, Alvin, who asks: uh, um, are, are the Sikorsky helicopters? Um, is it just the Black Hawk that that's being produced now? Is that the the models being produced now, or are there several? different ones being produced right now. You want me to talk, John? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Take it then. Um, there's several of them. It's a, it's a very busy time of the year. They're, first of all, in production, the Black Hawk is still in production, mainly for foreign customers and uh, fill aircraft for, for the Air Force. The Black Hawk, we, we're building Seahawks. Uh, the S-92 is a presidential helicopter. We also build it commercially. It's at a low rate, but it is being built. And the 76 is at a low rate and, and available. The development programs, the, the Defiant and the um, S-94, five is it, John? Uh, S-90, I'll look it up, S 95. Okay, those are currently in development and they're co competing. We are competing with uh, other other manufacturers on that aircraft. The Eventually, the military will make a decision on which configuration that they will go forward with in the future to replace aircraft like the Black Hawk, the Seahawk, uh, even the Apache and so forth. So those are those are pretty much the active activity right now, and of course the K model, the King Stallion as they call it, CH-53AK. That's the huge heavy lift aircraft. We delivered the first one a few weeks ago, and uh, in the write-up and going through the scenario, the factory is under renovation to increase rate, and hopefully in a couple of years, Sikorsky will reach a rate of producing one every 20 days that's where the target is headed and if you look at if you knew the factory 25 years ago you won't know it today because it's all dedicated to that heavy lift activity and could continue the black hawk so that's that's pretty much where we're at um uh, i have another question here uh jose asks uh uh, that uh, he said he was fascinated by the drawings of the fixed wing aircraft uh, that Sikorsky designed. Uh, how many of those drawings actually went into production? Uh, well, you can look at the chart. I don't have it in front of me. The, the chart, uh, for example, take the just take the American period. The American period is the S-29, only one was built and several other aircraft, there was only one built. But the S-38 was an amphibious aircraft that was being, began to be sold in 1928-29, and they built 111 of those aircraft. And that was really terrific. The rest of them became 10 of the S-44 flying boats, which uh, Pan American used to open up the air routes to the Pacific and the Atlantic. Uh, and the VS-44 was the final flying boat, three of them. Uh, they were used in World War II to carry dignitaries to foreign ports in uh, non-neutral uh, non, uh, countries and so forth. So uh, in front of me, I don't have it, but the, the drawings and sketches that you see, the those charts pretty much tell you whether it was one of a kind or two of a kind and, and so forth. They, they exist in various different degrees. Uh, let me, let me just go on, David, just one second on that one. Uh, there, we have, we are in possession of uh, many concept drawings. Those aircraft that never made it to a final experimental configuration or actual hardware being built. So it's very difficult to say how many of those were actually thought of, but uh, even today, uh, we have a separate department that is just looking into what are future concepts uh, of what the aircraft could look like. Okay, uh, and uh, let's see, Lisa asks, in the recent forest fires out in uh, 
out west were Sikorsky helicopters uh, a big factor in firefighting? Uh, certainly. Uh, there's, two, there's, there's two models that come to mind. Uh, one you saw earlier, the S-64 Sky Crane. Uh, that is being operated uh, as a uh, fire suppression uh, device. It has a huge tank. I figure what the gallon, gallon, and gallonage is. Uh, however, uh, it's being used as well as a version of the Black Hawk, which is also equipped with a belly tank. And uh, what's unique about both of these aircraft is that they have a huge snorkel associated with them. And they don't have to uh, go back to an airport and then get loaded up with, with more uh, a fire retardant and then take off and go back to the scene. Uh, they, all they have to do is find a local lake and they drop this snorkel in it. And it's just like a big vacuum cleaner. And within a matter of minutes, they can take on hundreds of gallons of water and take back off again and get to, to taking care of business on the fire. So That's helicopters have proved very, very effective. You see fixed wings doing it, but helicopters are more capable of uh, uh, looking at specific areas that have to be attended to. Okay, here's a question in from uh, Ellie, who asks, uh, most of the aircraft, uh, aircraft that have been shown have been for mil uh, military or res rescue operations. Uh, was there any development of uh, helicopters for private uh, use at Sikors uh, produced by Sikorsky? Well, uh, private or what you might call passenger carrying. The S-92, well, it started with the S-76. The S-76 was designed uh, purely for commercial purposes, uh, executive level or transportation from uh, small cities to two major airports, things like that. And then that was followed with the 90, the S-92. But in earlier years, for example, beginning with the S-55, the S-55 was the first uh, helicopter certified to carry passenger service. And people like New York Airways, Los Angeles Airways, Chicago Airways, and Sabina, all used began to carry passengers with that aircraft. It was a converted military aircraft to passenger service. The unique machines were the the two that that I that I mentioned. Do have any other thoughts, John, on that? Oh, you you, you covered them, Dan. Thank you. All right. Uh, David asks uh, whether or not uh, any of the Sikorsky helicopters or helicopters in general. Were they used in combat operations during World War II at all? The R-4, which we showed, was the first aircraft to go into, helicopter to go into production in 1943. A sample of one of those aircraft was sent to the China Burma Theater. And as you saw in the, the movie clip, uh, made the first combat rescue behind enemy lines. Now, it couldn't carry it could either carry a pilot and a co-pilot or a pilot and a passenger. So as they said in that clip, that aircraft flew behind enemy lines where the aircraft had gone down. And without a co-pilot, the wounded air person was put into the co-pilot seat and they moved him to safety and went through the 13 or 14 people in that fashion. But the 55 could now carry eight or 10 people in it. That was the transition to a, a more capacity type passenger aircraft. But World War II, yeah, yes, that was the aircraft credited with making the first combat rescue uh, in, in China, Burma at that time. Now, did the, the opposite uh, side, the Axis powers, did they use employ helicopters at all? No, as I mentioned, um, when it comes a question of inventions, a lot of people uh, ask the question, Ego's the inventor. Well, no, he proudly said, no, I'm not the inventor. I took uh, concepts and put it together and made the first practical helicopter. But other people had, you know, experimented with the helicopter. He says, and uh, his son told me this, and his father felt that if it wasn't for the World War II, the Germans would have had a very successful 
uh, production line and the helicopter in, in service before we were. Hmm. And the final question comes in from uh, Carissa. Uh, she wanted to know, uh, she saw the, the, the video you had of uh, the person being rescued off the barge and yeah. the helicopter lifts the person off and delivers it to somebody on the beach. Uh, is static electricity an issue with the, the helicopters in, in the air? It's, it's, it's beating its blades through the air and it's delivering somebody on the ground. Is, is that a danger or even a, a problem? That's an interesting story, and I'll, I'll tell you personally. Uh, back in 1957, I was sent to New Guinea, the island of uh, New Guinea, to do a uh, move uh, apparatuses to check for oil in the interior of New Guinea. And we had crews that worked at the, the station where we picked up the material and flew them to. And these crews were all native, and um, they had a leader, and they did what the leader said. And uh, the first lift, everything we did on this operation was external lift. It meant he had to connect it to a hook. Well, the first time the helicopter hovered over, he grabbed the hook, and he got the shock of his life and started running, and so did everybody else in the crew run with him until we got him back where you had to discharge the, the hook before you put the, the cable on to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that is automatically done now, John. I don't know quite how that well, happened. Okay, let's, let's not get people alarmed about uh, getting electrocuted. No, no. Uh, the, the, answer, <laughs> the direct answer to the question is uh, no, there is no chance of, uh, of people getting injured while they're on the aircraft, uh, none whatsoever. Uh, what Dan is talking about is the static electricity and the discharge to another piece of metal. And uh, you can get that when you, you're below the uh, aircraft or the, trying to hook up a Jeep or something like that. They traditionally have a, a lightning arrest rod and they go and they touch the hook and that will discharge the uh, uh, buildup of the static and uh, everything is okay after that. But uh, uh, no, from a, a flying in a helicopter, there is no problem with the static electricity. All right. Well, Dan, Dan and John, you have been terrific. I've, uh, the hour has flown by, uh, literally, and I uh, wanted to thank you both for your time and your expertise. I did have one more question that I'm gonna answer, actually. Uh, Patty asks whether any Sikorsky helicopters will be landing at TELUS this Saturday. No, uh, but the uh, I think they'll both be Bell helicopters, uh, but, uh, uh, you will have the opportunity to meet the pilots, and yes, you will have the opportunity to climb on board and, and look around uh, on the helicopters while they're on the ground. Um, anyway, thank you so much uh, for your time today. It's been fascinating. And again, uh, thank our, our sponsors, uh, uh, Century Bank uh, of Cartersville and uh, also uh, Marriott uh, Courtyard of Cartersville and uh, and uh, highlight all of uh, our sponsors for supporting this program. And thank you both for supporting uh, making science exciting and uh, presenting a new realm of science to our guests and our, our listeners from all over. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We're very happy to be part of TELUS and communicate in this, this event and the setting up of the exhibit was fantastic. Uh, we appreciate the relationship. Yep. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye for now. Hey, take care. Bye-bye.